Welcome to Societal Shapers, a podcast by PL Cadilla, the place to get inspired, find your purpose and courage, and get tools to become the next female leader, creating real results and meaningful changes. Welcome to the Societal Shapers podcast. Today, I am speaking to Dr. Maslan. She has an amazing bio, and I am super, um, super thankful and grateful and honored uh, that Dr. Mazan has agreed to, to speak at the at one of our sessions today. So a bit of background about Dr. Mazlan. Dr. Mazlan is a Malaysian astrophysicist whose work has pioneered Malaysia's participation in space exploration. She was Malaysia's first astrophysicist and helped to create a curriculum in astrophysics as a national university, as, as well as to build public awareness and understanding of astronomy and space issues. She was appointed Director General of ANCASA, the Malaysian National Space Agency, and served as a Director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs in Vienna from 2007 to 2014. So welcome, Dr. Maslan. So honored again to have you here. I'd like to start with, you know, uh, asking you, what is your, tell us a bit more about your personal story of growing up. And how did you um, go against the grain and be in the career that you're in today. Thank you, Pia, and I'm very happy to be doing this uh, recording. Um, yeah, so I, um, right from the very beginning, I think when I was young, I always um, was curious about things. Very, uh, as a child, I was very curious. And I think uh, being curious is what drove me uh, to look for things. And when you're looking for things, you find new things. And you, you discover that there are some things nobody wants to do or have done. And, um, and then, of course, uh, I thought to myself, if I wanted to do something that has an impact, it would have to be, do to be doing something different. And that's why you call it going against the grain. And that's what I call uh, wanting to do something different. So going back to um, the school that you, were, that you went, right? It was, I believe it was a, a, a girl's school. Yes. College in Kukusha. Yes. Yes. So how I did that experience... Girls will be listening in on this. Yes, exactly. So I, I'm wondering how did that experience shape you? Um, at TKC, you, you were independent of your family and the, your friends around you were your, uh, sub, that, that was your support system. And I think I, start, I learned to value uh, the support system from, well, sort of almost strangers, you know, because you, you expect that when you were young, it's only your family who will support you. But no, yeah. when you were in TKC, you had to make a life for yourself. You had to be independent and... Um, and it was a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say hardship, but um, things will not go your way. So you mm. need to find out where your niche is. And I think I, uh, in those four or five years, developed what, uh, what I was in terms of a niche of who I was. I didn't want to be like everybody else. But you discover this uh, when you are in a group of 350 uh, very bright um, very enthusiastic, talented girls, young yes. girls. Yes. Yeah, and did you, when did you find out that you wanted to be in the area of astrophysics? Oh, that one was not at school. Huh? Mm. I, at school, I, at, uh, at boarding school, I discovered physics. I mean, uh, uh, although I wanted so much to do English literature and art as my wow. as uh -huh. career, uh, my teachers, um, because of their forward-looking, um, you know, they were forward-looking and they knew what the country needed in the future and they decided the future, uh, there was no need for me to be an artist um, for the future and they thought that with what, with the talent that I had, okay, they knew my talent, I, I didn't at that stage, that I should be in the science. And they put me in the pure science stream and uh, through pure science, I discovered of course, maths and physics and chemistry, but I fell in love with physics. Oh, wow. So that's how you managed to, to decide on at that young age. But when did you decide to be, to be in astrophysics? 
okay. Then with, when I fell in love with physics, of course, that clearly meant I wasn't going to be a medical doctor. You remember, I'm, I'm almost 70, and at that point in time, everybody wanted to be a doctor. If you were a scientist, you wanted to be a doctor. But I yeah. very clearly realized that, no, 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 I... Um, I didn't want to be a medical doctor. And so when it came to selecting what I wanted to do in university, I chose physics, which again was against the grain in that sense, because as I said, the top students always ended up going to medical school. But yeah. I decided, no, no, I wanted to be a physicist. And I went, um, I got the Colombo Plan Scholarship to do physics. Mm. University. And in the university was where I discovered astrophysics. You see, if I had stayed on in Malaysia and went to one of the universities in Malaysia, I would not have discovered astrophysics. So I was very, very lucky that I was sent overseas where in the Department of Physics, they also offered uh, things like astrophysics, atmospheric physics. Um, yeah. And that was when I uh, discovered that actually, that all this, when I was, I mean, why did I want to do English literature and art? It was because I loved philosophy and the wooliness of things. Mm -hmm. And yet I was good in science. So um, doing astrophysics allowed me to do the science, which is very precise, etc. But in astronomy and astrophysics, there's always this wooliness. And until today, is the wooliness, you know, the uncertainties, mm -hmm. uh, um, astrophysics and astronomy that's actually driving all of physics and I, I didn't know this you know, but yeah. it's because I was so curious I wanted to do things that are different I wanted things to be beautiful and woolly you know all these contradictions but it's all in astrophysics and, and that was a perfect combination for me interesting so by virtue of the uh, the nature of the course itself it sounds like uh, at that time particularly uh, it was probably very heavily male dominated, similarly oh, yeah. to like tech today as well, right? How, you know, we're, we're trying to get more women in tech. Yes. So at that time, being probably, you know, one of the few females to be in this industry, tell us a bit more about your journey being a woman in this uh, space and all your other colleagues being male. I, I was only, not one of the many girls, I was the only girl in my course. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, about three years. I mean, first you had to do the general, you know, first mm. year before you qualify to do it, before they allow you to do something like physics. I was in the physics honors class mm. and I was the only girl in the physics honors class um, yeah. right to the end. And uh, doing my PhD, I was also the only girl doing a PhD. Um, in my university, in physics, of course, yeah. other fields. So, um, uh, okay, in the in in the pH, at the PhD level, it wasn't too difficult. But at the undergraduate level, I, you know, you had to have a partner at the at the bench for doing yeah. experiments. And you know, I always had the last boy in the class who had no partner to partner with me. <laughs> Usually, like you choose. I was the problem was not only was I female, I was also brown, um, you know, and and, and a foreigner. Yeah. <laughs> if I was yeah. if I was a brown Maori. Maybe it wouldn't be too bad. Here I was brown and Asian, and yeah. you know, different, yeah. different from everybody. That's still happening today. <laughs> they were all, um, and majority of them were white. You know. Mm. So um, yeah, so it was uh, difficult in that sense. Um, but even if I had to be alone at the bench, I didn't worry too much about it. And when we did uh, workshops, you know, where we had to cut steel and solder, a uh, weld steel, um, I was always, uh, I had, you know, when we had to cut the steel, even though I put on my whole weight, I could not cut the steel. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the facilitator would help me or another guy would have to come help me. But it was always, um, very interesting stories in my career where as a girl, uh, actually I didn't have the brawn to do everything that I needed to do, which is quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, but do, so during this time, right, because earlier, just before we started the podcast, we spoke a bit about um, how you don't see, so you don't see gender bias. So now it sounds, <laughs> now it sounds like because, you know, you spent most of your time being in a classroom uh, with the other male counterparts, and therefore, you know, you just saw that as a norm. 
So there yeah. wasn't any different differences. It was the norm. You're right. You've hit it yeah. on the yeah. It was my norm. Okay. So then, how when you when you started working, right? Then of course the world of 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 um, when you, as in the world of uh, uh, of being a career in this specific area is basically something that we find everywhere. Politics, you know, everybody wanting to get promoted, wanting to go up the ladder. So now, did you start feeling uh, the heat? Yes, uh, but not as a, as a female. Uh, mm. I had two advantages. One is that it was a new field. I had come in, there was no, you know, you said I was the first astrophysicist in the country. So I right. came into a, literally a vacuum vacuum of people. So what was there to be biased against whom? For mm -hmm. what, you know? Yeah, because yeah. there was really nobody there and- um, No competition. The, the space as in, not space space, but the space yeah. was there for me to, um, to chorograph, to, to manipulate, you know, as, as I needed to. Um, but of course, as a career, then within that career, um, yeah. Because I started off as an academic, you had to have um, research grants. With the classes, it was okay. I could then teach astronomy or astrophysics to whoever I liked, develop all the courses. But having to do research, that was a different ball game. And mm. so I was. They were. They told me that since uh, physics was not a thrust, that actually I might, I should choose another research field. This is the research field. Uh, and I thought about it for a bit, and I thought they're right. Because to survive as an academic, I had to write paper, do, do research, write papers. And so I decided maybe the nearest thing I had to astronomy was solar, solar energy. It's the closest thing to a celestial object, a heavenly object. Yeah. But then I discovered that there was really nothing happening in solar energy either at that time, you know, 35 yeah. years yeah. ago. And after three years of trying this out, I thought, you know what, I can't, I, 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 I cannot do this anymore. I'm wasting my time. But of course, I spent the, the first one, one and a half years setting up a, a, a daycare center, that sort of thing to amuse myself, you know, <laughs> um, because I, I needed it for my son. Um, yeah. Then I discovered after three years, you know, I either leave or do something mm -hmm. about it. Uh, I, to leave, I thought maybe I should leave and apply to be a diplomat. Okay. Yes, I. That was very very high priority. The other was that I should start this new field, and um, luckily for me, there was a course on for young astronomers. I was young at the time. For young, astronomers, <laughs> very young now. Uh, to um, you know, to re refresh ourselves, mm. and I went to Indonesia. And then I discovered that love for astronomy all over again, you know. But then wow. I, I decided, you know, there is no vacuum at all. It was only in my mind. That vacuum, I, I didn't have a vacuum because the whole, I had all these people, these fantastic people throughout the world to mm. assist me. No, there was no vacuum at all. There was only a vacuum if I saw myself in this little space. Um, yeah. in the university and yeah. so I decided to carry on and a lot of the astronomers international astronomers gave me grants to travel to um, to present papers they gave me money for research uh, and I did my sabbatical in Japan you know all um, all funded uh, internationally uh -huh. mm -hmm. so you only see uh, a vacuum if you only look at a small part of your world and and that's when i had to start international um mm. right from get-go i could not persist in my career if i stayed national so that yeah. was the best part of it that yeah. um, circumstances forced me to become international and at that point not many malaysians went international um yes. in the early 80s People Absolutely. were cutting up everything in, in the country and they, they had a support system within the country. I had none. I had none. And so yeah. I had to do for it overseas. So, you know, this is how you turn an adversary, adversity, hmm. adversity into an opportunity. 
And yeah. this is really what I did. And I never looked back. Yeah. And, and okay, so to, uh, you asked the story. So how did I then do things? So how did I go against the green? So I went into my, I remember the head of the department at that time, and I said to him, you know what, I'm going to go into astrophysics, even though there is no thrust in this. And um, he said, oh, then you won't get any uh, research grants, you won't publish, and you'll never be promoted. I said, that is not, uh, you know, if I don't start this field, nobody will ever start. Hmm. And I need to make a start. And it doesn't matter if I, you know, uh, didn't, wasn't promoted because I knew that I would get, a, I get ahead uh, doing things internationally, not yeah. locally. Yeah. So, so you need to be focused on what it is that you want to be in the future and yeah. look there, not mm. here and now. Mm. You yeah. got to look far ahead. Yeah. It's not very easy for a lot of people to say, I'm going to give up, have any thought of promotion. Yeah. Uh, not people like that, but if you look far enough ahead, you wouldn't worry about that. Why would you worry about that? Yeah. I, so I really love this story, right? As, as I'm listening to your story, there's so many pieces of nuggets that I just want to highlight to the audience. Yes. So a lot of times people today, is there's a lot of white noise. Um, you know, the, the, our life is satiated with with uh, social media and information mm -hmm. and so you know listening to your story how do you keep yourself focused how do you keep yourself on track it really is about having a vision first ha you know and then starting with the beginning in mind then then that will help to shape you and know and be able to listen to your to your inner instincts of what's yeah. right and what's wrong but throughout your story you've you've shared you know there, there there's been pivotal moments where you've had to make really tough decisions right and these are not easy decisions especially when you're when you're alone so it's a very lonely world for you because you were the only one in that space so you know having that courage to be able to still pursue your dreams despite people saying no we don't think it's a good idea you know you're not going to make money etc but you still went for it so I think that's, that's, that's an amazing uh, example of courage, having clarity in, in your life and being able to pursue it and having the confidence to do that as well. But, you know, you asked, what was it that drove me? Yes. What drove me was ambition. Now, as I said, I'm one yes. shy. I can tell, you know, yes. maybe because maybe in, uh, um, before I was a bit too, too embarrassed or too, too modest to say what yes. was happening. But yeah. no, I don't think ambition drove me. And yeah. um, what was that ambition? That ambition yeah. was to carve a path for myself into yeah. the future that would, um, what is that word? Distinguish me from everybody else. I yeah. think, I mean, it's clear. I, mean, I didn't want to do whatever anybody else was doing. If somebody else was doing that, I thought to myself, you know, he or she is doing a great job. Let, let, let that happen. But yeah. is there something that nobody has thought about? Is there something people found mm. too difficult to do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, impossible. Um, yeah. Those were the things, those were the words that yeah. uh, triggered me. You know, if people say this is too hard or people say uh, it's impossible, uh, yeah. your Muslim's ears will perk up. And <laughs> until, <laughs> until today, impossible and are my two go-to words. I mean, like, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Those words actually drive you. That's so interesting. Yes, a lot of times when it's... people hear the word, it's too difficult, yeah, uh, yeah. too complicated, and then they just shy away. They're like, okay, yes. you know, I'm going to give up because that's the easy route, right? Yes. I yeah. just spend a little bit of a moment to give, um, to give respect to this word, ambition. So... Hmm. If you looked at the word ambitions, there, there, there's two ways, right? There could be some negative connotations to the word ambition. Because people think, you know, I'm going to, you know, achieve my career and my dream at all costs. So it doesn't matter who gets hurt along the way. And then there's this part where you, sh you should have and you should be ambitious for yourself. Yeah. But within the values and principles that you have developed Absolutely. and not hurting people along the way. Right. Yeah, so, so it does not mean that you're ambitious. It means you've got to stab everybody in the back, step on everyone. No, yeah. uh, 
So you, um, the thing is, as I said, when I was ambitious, it was about setting up up something new and if there's something new I wasn't stabbing anybody in the back because there was no back towards me <laughs> I was there in front and even if I turned to the back there was nobody behind me <laughs> I didn't have to step on anybody or stab anybody in front mm. of me um, yeah. so I, I chose the a path that was uh, as I said uh, not many people mm, yeah. have because sometimes when you are ambitious you're right you have to stab people in the back and step on someone but mm -hmm. I was lucky that I chose a, a, a path where I had to clear it myself. I had to go out with the machete and, you know, literally cut the, uh, the, the bramble bush, you know, to yeah. move forward. So if there's that bramble bush with all the thorns, there was nobody in front. So, uh, but, but no, I don't agree that if you have to be ambitious, it means you have to be mean and nasty. No. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are ambitious to achieve a goal and still be very nice to everybody. I'm not saying I'm very nice to everybody, but no, currently, whoever is ambitious, you can do that. Oh, of course you can do that. I yeah. totally agree. And this is something which I actually tell my husband, right? I said, you know what I like about you? I like you because you're ambitious. I find a lot of <laughs> oh, yeah. in the I past, love men ambitious. whom I've dated are very content with where mm -hmm. they are. So they just, you know, stay, stay stack, mm -hmm. static and stagnant in their growth. And there's no motivational factor to want to drive them. So I think it's really important. And Pierre, I think he likes you, he admires you because you are ambitious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's very true. So just, you know, in, in this whole area, I'm, I'm very curious, Dr. Mazza, because you're very positive. You know, you look like you have everything together and it's not the case for many people no, no, so no. <laughs> <laughs> doing everything together uh, that's, the first, that's the first what is that word delusion that you must get rid of i'm here where i am because i make the best out of everything you know out of yeah. this even this podcast i'm trying to make the best of it trying to convince women that this is fine you can be ambitious but no don't for a single moment think everything's laid out nicely for me oh no <laughs> So no, on that another, point, on that yeah. point, could you share with us a moment where, you know, you were completely flat down at the bottom and then, you know, that event basically gave you the biggest push of your life or something that was, that triggered you to actually pivot or just, you know, share with us something a bit more personal. Well, okay. Uh, I wouldn't dwell on this, but yeah. I was right at the bottom of my line where I thought I was at the bottom of black hole and you know when I say black hole I mean black hole meaning that you can <laughs> ever get out of it yeah. um, scientifically but yeah. I did get out of it but um, that was on my own personal life you know I was going through a divorce and you know it was a black hole I was in a black hole and it was only my daughter who helped me get out of that uh, wow. black hole uh, and, mm -hmm. to, and, and friends too and friends but I think career-wise, I would say that I was really at the, in the pits um, during the time of the astronaut program. I mean, the astronaut program was reaching its peak. Um, I had worked years and years to make it happen, you know? Yeah. And then I was removed from that position because somebody thought I was overreaching or not overreaching, I was... Um, too ambitious? I don't want to find the words for it. But, you know, somebody did not like me in that uh, position mm. of leadership, of leadership, and he mm. removed me. And yet he wanted me to do the work, you know. So my team and I had to do all the work still to make that program happen. But we were, the, the leadership was removed from us. Uh, I don't know how to say this. I, I, I explain it or not, but it meant that we would not get the credit. Mm. Uh, so my team who worked so hard, I can name you so many of them, but they never ever got the credit for the uh, astronaut program, for the Ankasawan program. I don't care that I didn't get the credit, but I, I uh, and I felt at that time that maybe the best thing was for me to leave because if I left, I thought, then the credit might still go to my team because that would exclude me. So if, mm. as long as I was part of the team, they would have to credit me, right? 
and they didn't yeah. want that. They hated me. So, uh, but if I left, then my team would get the credit, and that's all I wanted. Did that and happen? Yes, so just before the end of the program, and I knew that things were already in place, things would not go wrong anymore. I, I, we had done most of the things. I left. I mean, I uh, not resigned, but I just took. Uh, I, I was on. Almost, I was on retire. I was going to be retiring, and I just took early leave three months before, you know, and that got me out of that. And I, I think to some extent, uh, the agency got the um, acknowledgement. I'm not talking about credit uh, acknowledgement, but not to the uh, to the point that they. Uh, the full credit for it. But yeah. you know, that was the real bottom of my life. And I think in those last um, two years, I was in Malaysia um, running the Angkasa One program, particularly the last year. I think it aged me by about 10 years. And I was sick almost every day because oh my God. You know, I couldn't stand what was happening. And yet, yeah, uh, there's a different story altogether. But I have to, if you're asking me, when was I at the pits of my professional life yep. that was it. and that's why I had to leave I had to leave with a, some shred of dignity um, and I left to, to go back to the UN and my daughter I remember she said mama uh, because I, I asked should I go again because I'd gone and come back and then they offered it to me again I asked my family should I go again and both my children said me mama you have to leave and my daughter was uh, seven or eight years old at the time you had to leave in some of your dignity, Mama, uh, you have to leave. And I left in order to maintain my dignity and my integrity. And my integrity was what hurt me so much that I, one year I couldn't sleep, I was sick. But at the end, it was a battle. But I had maintained my integrity, okay? That was what yeah. got me into so much trouble. Yeah. But to, 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 to give myself some dignity, you know, that I yeah. give people some dignity and, yeah. and that meant leaving the country and I did for seven years oh wow that is I, a really it's, a, it's a big story <laughs> yeah I mean thank you so much for sharing Dr. Mazan so you know it is really more for the audience to know that life is not always flowers and roses right absolutely <laughs> no. Yes. And don't ever for one minute think that uh, life is going to be great for me or all the time, every step of the way. There have been personal, you know, um, setbacks, career setbacks, relationship. I'm not just talking about husband and wife, but with your friends, with your yes. other family, siblings, there will be setbacks there. And your children, of course. So, uh, so many things can go wrong and they will go wrong. Yeah. But it does not mean that you have to forego your ambition. And I'm still talking about ambition in the in the good, you know, yes. having achieved something positive for you and and the world, hopefully. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. And I you know, I, I feel very impacted by the story. And as I reflect back on some of my stories, I think that's that's something which you just are non-negotiables, right? Which is your integrity. Mm, mm. Absolutely. That's that's something which is non-negotiable, and people need to be able to because then you can't live with yourself. No. So that this brings up me to, to my next question, which is, I know this has, you've gone through like the lowest of the low and it's probably shaped the philosophy of life that you have. So if you were a politician today, <laughs> which portfolio would you hold and why? You know, I thought about this question. I looked at it this morning and said, if you were a politician, which portfolio would you hold and why? And I wondered how I would answer that. And my answer was, is no, I never want to be a politician ever. But, but why is this question being asked? This question is being asked because we perceive that as a politician, we will be able to move and change things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think so. I think all of us at some personal level can move and change things without ever being a politician. So if I had a dream of some power position, okay? Now we're mm. talking about being in a power position, not powerful, but yeah. power position. Yeah. I want to be an Elon Musk. Because wow. he has his, and whatever ambition he's trying to drive, it's he is driving it. He's getting his, mm. he put in his own money. Of course, the, uh, he, he put in his own 
all of us put ourselves into the, 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 our dreams, you know. But he put it himself and he actually takes money out of his own pocket for a start. And then, of mm. course, he proves himself and then he gets money. Uh, in, the, in the space business, he got money from NASA. But, you know, he, he was concerned about too many emissions, too much emissions, uh, about climate change. So he, yeah. he built electrical cars and he was in a traffic jam and he thought that must be a way of overcoming this you know? and he thought about boring underground and he set up a company and today we, we, we will we will definitely go towards um, I can't remember the name now we will go underground in pots you know that will accelerate us and having to uh, undo the traffic jam mm. and he thought there must be more to this world than just here and he wants to take people to Mars and you know so I like Elon Musk. Not you know, he has a terrible personality. Some people, I, I love his personality by the way, but yeah. some <laughs> terrible personality um, that he is able to put in a total commitment, and not only to one thing, yeah, but to five different things. Um, mm. And it's a personal commitment. As I say, everything comes from his own money, which is why when I. Um, you know, when I was the head of the space agency, I could always find money or when I was head of planetarium uh, to, to promote art science because that's the, my other love, you know, the art science. But when I came home, I thought I am in no position whatsoever to drive art science because it needs funding and, and whatnot, you know. And that yeah. was when I put in my own money to set up a fund for art science. And, I, and of course, I'm, I'm like a millionth of what Elon Musk is worth. Yeah. You know? yeah. But the important thing is to start something not only with a personal, you know, philosophical, ideological commitment, but yeah. where you put the money where your mouth is, I told myself. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, so so I, I cannot even be proud of it, but. What happens is then I at least can say there is this endowment. Uh, would you like to put money on it to somebody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So to summarize, um, hmm. in order to become a systemic change maker, right? So societal hmm. shapers is all about wanting to push for some uh, changes on a systemic level. You don't have to become a politician in order to do that. You can That's do it in different point. ways. Yes, That's fantastic. Point. Yes. So I hope the audience will be able to take this away and also really think about, but. The, the road or, to, or the path to making any changes, either in politics or in business or in the science and arts, etc., there's no shortcuts. Uh, there's no easy way. You're right. Then there's you're no right. replacement for hard work. And that is so important. And the love inside your heart, you know? Mm -hmm. The passion. Yes. So now, you know, Dr. Maza, you you mentioned a bit about art science and the passion about art science. Before we finish off, why don't you share a bit more about what, what is art science and what it's all about? Okay, so just to give you a background, when I became in charge of the planetarium, we had to do shows, you know, movies and things like that. And I always had a story to tell, of course, about the sun, about the universe, and these are stories with science, you know, it's a background. But mm -hmm. I knew that I could not tell the story like you read a science book and you had to combine the visuals, the sounds, the, 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 the narration uh, to bring the story to the public. And that is where there's a convergence of the arts mm -hmm. and science. So even though I was interested in, uh, in arts all my life, but then um, it became really uh, in the face, you know, I had to do this. And I noticed that there was nothing around me or, or people that were comfortable in this convergence space. Yeah. You were either an artist or you were a scientist and there was nobody, nobody doing that. Mm -hmm. that convergence yeah. or at interface or comfortable. I had to, you know, make people comfortable and they come in. I had an artist in residence program, that sort of thing. Then, yeah. you know, in, in all this, uh, all the time, uh, I was looking for this convergence of the arts and the science. And, but then today, what, you can, everything that you see around you is a convergence of the arts and science. Um, yeah. It's just that we need to focus on it and give get some people out of the closet, so to speak. Mm. So the scientists who are also artists feel I'm okay, I can I can confess to this. Or yeah. the 
artists who love science, and I know many artists who are so inspired by uh, by science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the one artist said to me, the uh, the newest um, uh, thoughts, uh, creative thoughts that he has come across is when he's listening to a science to a science discovery. Mm. You know, and I thought, oh yeah. wow, yes. Um, so there is the arts and the science. Just we need to get everybody, not everybody, to get to, to for a start. Let people think it's okay to be at this convergent space. Um, it is an agnostic space. Mm -hmm. neither, you, you, you don't subscribe to anything. It's an agnostic space. Yeah. So now that we've we've understood, you know, what this space is of art science, where. Uh, so in which areas or places do you contribute? How can we see your work? How do we be part of it? No, 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 no. <laughs> me. It's not about me making that painting. Mm -hmm. um, but all my life, I bring people together and I create a space for people. I created the space program so that the young engineers uh, can come in, build satellites, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that they can have a career in space. So, uh, I, I never, I myself have not benefited from it. So, so that I create, I built an observatory so that uh, my the young astronomers have a place where they can observe. I provide funding so that they can go out and um, go to observatories and present papers. You know, things that I never had when I needed them. So mm. I create those spaces, those facilities, the ecosystem for the people coming after me. So when you say that, I don't have to step on anybody because I have to make sure they, <laughs> I, I'm serving them, you know? So um, uh, what was the question you asked? Um, so for example, like, you know, you, you're saying that you've created this space, especially for like kids, yes. for them to be able to, to experience this. Yes. So if so I have two sons, they're 10 oh, and 12. We have to bloom, we have to thrive. Yes. Yeah, so how do I, how do, how can my kids... You were asking me, did, do I have an artwork? No, no, my idea yeah. is not, I produce the artwork. Of course, I have this uh, ambition that one day I'll, um, you know, play the cello successfully or do some pottery. Those yeah. are still my own personal ambitions, but it's not like I'm doing this for me to, yeah. to excel. No, I'm doing this like I always do for other people to excel, whether it's the uh, astronaut program or whether it's the artist in residence program or whether it's the observatory, it's for others to excel. So how can they join? How can these kids participate oh, in this program? Uh, okay, yeah. you, you go to Art Science uh, uh -huh. at the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Academy of Sciences Science Malaysia. Malaysia. Yeah, we have a website. Okay. You go to Art Science. There's a form for you to sort of indicate uh, that you are interested in this. And we and in fact, I'm sorry, but the closing date for indication is 30th of June. Uh, that you indicate what is it that you have in mind, and then uh, the um, after 30th June, we'll be in touch with you uh, to see uh, what is it you have. Okay, and and how old can how old are the people who can participate? Hello, I'm 70, so I'm not ages. So you can be 80 or 90. And, <laughs> and I have my grandchildren who are seven and five. So how would I, you know, limit my grandchildren? <laughs> yes, yes. So any, it's open to anybody. No age limit. Wow, fantastic. Any media at all. Whether you're talking about um, the, the canvas or mm. the computer or yeah. this or you're using, uh, we have people who are using um, music, who are using, mm. okay, bacteria uh, mm. to, to, to demonstrate art science. Wow, music. that's really interesting. Okay, I will leave a link to the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Uh, when, well, yeah, Academy yeah, of Science it, Malaysia. Yeah. yeah, and then people can also sign up later for hopefully the next intake if we, if we don't get enough for before the 30th of June. Yes, so, yeah. okay, thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Mazan. Nice. A movement, you know, where we'll okay. have um, all the time promotions, uh, but the price is, of course, the price, but there'll be another price um, in a couple of years. So, it's, uh, okay. I'm hoping to create a movement. I see. Okay. Yeah. This is very interesting. I think it's quite new as well yes. right it's, uh, it's 
I, I keep telling people, nobody has claimed that space in Malaysia. Art mm -hmm. science is a big thing in Europe. It is already quite a big thing in Singapore, but art science, nobody has claimed that space in Malaysia. Okay, so that's really interesting. Let's save that for another podcast session. Yes. yes. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Mazda. We really thank appreciate you, you being here and being so open and honest with all your sharing. So we will see you again in the next session. Take care and thank you. Thank you so much for listening in. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment and share with your friends. Be sure to tune in to the next episode and to find out how to be part of Societal Shapers, head to www.plcadilla.com and check out our coaching programs. Catch you soon!